Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on Timely Tips for Teaching Reproduction. My name is Adam Kiska, and I am the Life Sciences Marketing Manager at Sendage. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Liz Coe. And uh, Liz, please take it away. So I am uh, Liz Coe. I work at Boston University where I teach anatomy and physiology and uh, physiology of reproduction. Uh, and so I'm super excited to share this webinar with um, all of you today. And I'm excited that you guys are here and want to learn. Um, a couple of years ago, I started to think about how I could be a little bit more inclusive in the way that I presented some of the ideas in my classes. Uh, and that actually was a really kind of swift evolution. So I am by no means an expert, but I have been thinking about this question for a while. And so I'm excited to think about it all together. Um, so my um, agenda for us today is first kind of why to teach reproduction in your class at all. I think the, the kind of <laughs> number one coalescing pain point for us as a and instructors is that there's so much to cover. Um, and I think that uh, reproduction often gets lost and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So hopefully I'll be able to persuade you today to, um, to recognize this important system and share it with your students. And then I actually think that this is the perfect place to start with teaching inclusively. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what that means and, and then we'll talk about how, uh, how to do that in the reproduction system. And then uh, if this is a place where you might start to use some of these kind of broader terms and more inclusive language, how to carry this into other systems that you teach. <clears throat> so why teach reproduction when there is so much else to cover? So when I arrived at Boston University 10 years ago, I realized that there wasn't a single one of our anatomy or physiology classes that was teaching reproduction. Uh, so I started teaching it in my class, but the more that I kind of had you know, talks with other instructors, I found that it was left off uh, uh, in a lot of curricula. So it turns out that only 13 states require medically accurate reproduction information in high school curriculum. Uh, and if you're thinking in that kind of high school lens, reproduction comes at the end of the year when there's like many field trips and graduation practices and, and lots of outside constraints and distractions that interrupt class time. So that understanding that made sense to me because I find that when I teach reproduction in my classes, the students are less prepared than I would expect them to be. Uh, and so it makes sense that a lot of them aren't getting very much in high school at all. And then, as I said, here at BU, when I arrived, there was no kind of reproduction uh, in our undergraduate curriculum. Uh, and I think this is widely true. I think a lot of people leave it out for time constraints, discomfort, kind of um, they think it might be controversial. Um, but I, for most of us, I think it's mostly time. Again, it comes at the end of the semester. Oftentimes by then, we had a snow day or a hurricane day or some other disruption to our syllabus. We kind of have been making up time. So oftentimes we find that, that by the end of the, the semester, we don't have everything, uh, the time to teach everything we wanted to. But if we have our students missing some of this curriculum in high school and then missing this curriculum in undergrad, it means that many of our students do not receive scientifically accurate reproduction system ed uh, education until they get to nursing and medical school if they go those routes or, or PA school or wherever they go. So at this point, they're in their mid-20s, right? They've probably been users of their reproduction system for a while, and they aren't getting any scientifically accurate information. So if, if we aren't talking to them about reproduction, uh, where do you think the students are getting their questions answered? You can kind of put those in the chat if you'd like. Oh, I didn't even think of TikTok. Yep, totally. <laughs> so all types of media, Google, the internet, TikTok, each other, their friends, right? These are some of the, uh, the things that, um, that I guessed too, right? And so one of the things that I find is not only are we going to see these students using information that might not be medically accurate, um, but also when they do get to that place where they're being taught, I don't know if you ever find this in your classes, but I sometimes feel like if I'm trying to teach the students something that they feel like they already know, they're pretty resistant to that information, right? They're like, oh, but wait, I, I heard this years ago. So I think that kind of holistically, it's important for students to get access to accurate information about reproduction um, as early as possible and as thoroughly as, as possible. So I actually think this is a perfect place to, to think about inclusive teaching. And um, before I actually, before I get into that, the, um, for the next couple of slides, when we talk about inclusive teaching, I think about my students in three ways, right? I think my, of my students being students in this class 
who are trying to learn, even though they might have a lot of other things going on in their lives, right? Other stressors, anxieties, things like that. So I, I think about how to help my students learn the best they can. I also think about my students leaving my class and acting for the rest of their lives as advocates in their own medical life, right? To talk to their doctors, to ask for help when they need it. And to oftentimes they're advocates for the rest of their family too. And then I also think of my students as future medical professionals, right? The majority of my students are, are angling towards some sort of um, a healthcare career. All right, so inclusive teaching in reproduction. We wanna think about the fact that disorders of sexual development occur in approximately one out of every 5,000 births. Uh, so we have um, students definitely uh, amongst our um, student population who are kind of um, uh, diagnosed with a disorder of sexual development and kind of walking around maybe um, confused about how they fit into the categories that we present in terms of male and female. 2.2% of students that apply for college admission uh, identify as trans or non-binary on their admissions application. It's kind of a high stakes place to reveal yourself. Uh, so I, I dug a little deeper and found that estimates of young adults um, uh, think that about 5% of young adults of, uh, under the age of 30 are either trans or non-binary. So in my class of 100, I can probably guess that at least five of my students don't fit or don't identify neatly within the categories of male and female. But even if all of my students did identify as male or female, um, they're going to go be healthcare providers in a world in which their patients do not all identify that way. So again, thinking about our students in the classroom in one way, we wanna make this as inclusive for them as possible, but we also wanna prepare them as future healthcare providers. Uh, so when we think about our students as students, we look at um, the factors that are predictive of their success. And all students, but especially at-risk students, identify a sense of belonging in the classroom and a sense of community as being a really important component of their learning. And this has been shown in studies to increase student performance, decrease student anxiety, and increase student willingness to engage in challenging thinking, all things that are important for an a and classroom. And so when we think about um, kind of ways that we can foster that sense of community and we can subtly encourage students to feel that they belong, teaching inclusively has got to be kind of amongst, you know, the most important things we can do. We also know that trans and gender non-conforming students leave STEM majors at a 10% higher rate than cisgender students. So this is um, about retention uh, and encouraging everyone to kind of pursue their passions, right, uh, and their interests. Okay, I'm gonna take us away from reproduction for a moment to give an example about why representation in education matters. So a 2008 study of anatomy and physiology textbooks found that men are represented three times more often than women in diagrams. And that's even diagrams of things that have nothing to do with sex. We know that heart attack symptoms of women are a little bit different. It's a different kind of list than for men. Yet, heart attack symptoms of women were not taught regularly in medical schools until 2012. And they're still taught inconsistently if you look at medical school curricula across the country. This is probably the foundational problem that leads to the odds of a woman experiencing a myocardial infarction having an incorrect initial diagnosis is 37% higher than a man having an incorrect diagnosis. And this one really gets me. The single biggest factor in predicting the survival of a heart attack for a woman is whether or not she's treated by a female physician. Now let that sink in for a second. That says to me that there's a failure in education, right? And so we as, oh, and the last one, sorry. Um, that the most effective tools to improve cardiovascular outcomes for female patients is their own self-advocacy. And so if you look at things like WebMD or Harvard Health or like major websites that are promoting health, they're encouraging women to act as their own self-advocates to try to turn these numbers around. So that tells me that we, us sitting here in this webinar, us a and instructors, we have the ability to use education to directly improve healthcare outcomes, right? Whether or not we are helping the students to be better self-advocates for their own care, or changing the dynamic that happens and part of the education of our future healthcare system, this is really our role. We have the ability to change it. Uh, 
So turning our lens back to reproduction, pregnant women in the US are two times more likely to die from pregnancy or birth complications than any other high income nation in the world. The rate of maternal morbidity is actually rising year by year in the United States right now instead of falling. And maternal mortality is three times higher for black women than white women. So I think that if we think about areas where better education of our future medical care providers and better education of self-advocates, this is an area that is, could really benefit from, from a little bit more attention. So I wanna stop right there and see if anybody has uh, questions or kind of comments for discussion that you want to pipe in. I do not see any questions in Q&A, but there was one comment from Patrick saying I've started using differences in sexual development in class, which is the same acronym, but more inclusive. Hi, Patrick. Nice to hear from you. And um, and yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that completely. Whenever we can get away from the idea of disorder or abnormal or kind of those things that impart uh, some sort of a negative connotation, I think that that is awesome. Okay. There's no questions, and I'll go a little bit into how I approach this in the classroom. Um, so the first thing that I always do whenever I'm doing something new in the class uh, is that I always kind of approach it with humility. I'm totally transparent with my students, and I say, I'm learning how to teach this differently than how I was taught it. Bear with me if I ever use the wrong word, and please give me your feedback. And then again and again, I kind of try to bring that up so that the students know that I'm trying, and I might not be perfect. And they can also coach me if they have other ideas. <clears throat> and then I start with the correct terminology. I'll show you that slide um, in a second. And then my perspective on teaching um, reproduction is that I introduce the hormones first. The hormones drive everything. So rather than this idea of maleness versus femaleness, I talk about estrogen and testosterone and progesterone. Uh, and I use that as the, the kind of lens, the set of glasses through which we look at all of the, um, of the information in the course. <clears throat> and so that allows us to do something like secondary sex characteristics, right? Instead of saying, these are the secondary sex characteristics of female, I say, these are the effects of increasing estrogen signaling within the body. <laughs> and then I do a little bit of development. So I, I'm not a developmental biologist. If any of you are kind of developmental biologists or you teach a lot of development in your a class, I can apologize outright. Um, what I will show you is like two slides. That's very simple, um, but and probably way, way more simple than how you teach it, likely. Uh, but using that little bit of development doesn't take a ton of time, but it does lead us to being able to teach the structures through a homologous lens. So I say again and again, we have the same parts in a different organization, but it all starts from the same materials. And I think that that allows us to kind of really widen the perspective uh, for how the students are viewing these structures. So this is the slide. There's a million versions of this out there uh, that I start off any discussions with. And uh, one is it allows me to kind of really center on what we're doing in the classroom. I'm a biologist and we're talking about anatomy and physiology. We're talking about biological sex and that's separate from identity, expression or orientation. And so it both that using this both allows me to kind of give everybody the words that they need to use and to say, this is, this is where, you know, this is the lane that we're gonna stay in. <clears throat> so then I start with hormones. This is a slide that I used in my 300 level class, and I use a more simplified version of it in my one and 200 level classes. But the idea here is, is that I can tell our students that we start with cholesterol um, and then we come to a common precursor, androstadione. And from there, depending on which enzymes we have, we can either have estrogen or we can have testosterone. And testosterone can be converted to estrogen and is converted to estrogen kind of widely in the body. It all depends on what the enzymes are. So again, we're just kind of, we're not saying this is absolutely male, this is absolutely female, because that isn't accurate, but we're saying that everything is kind of um, uh, derived from what signaling molecules we have around. <clears throat> and so here's my very simplified view of development that I use to allow us to have this conversation based in homology. So the first seven weeks of embryology is the indifferent stage, meaning that all embryos develop approximately the same parts. 
And I point out to the students that reproductive development is kind of cool because if we think about kind of other primordial structures, right? Primordial lungs become lungs. Primordial cardiomyocytes become cardiomyocytes. But primordial reproductive structures have this kind of um, potential to develop in different ways. So that's, that's unique and it's cool. And it's also, it's based entirely on signaling molecules that are present. So whatever development results, kind of to Patrick's point about differences instead of disorders, right? To whatever um, our end structures are, it's the results of all the signaling. <clears throat> so in, in this indifferent stage around weeks five or six, we see that the structures, um, that all of our embryos will begin to develop two sets of structures. Uh, these are two sets of, of kind of tubes and they will become the ducts of the reproductive system. And then at that point where we go from the indifferent state to the different state, we, we really have the um, onboarding of a bunch of signaling molecules. And again, the presence of which signaling molecules and which concentrations is going to determine what development proceeds. So in individuals with a Y chromosome, there are, there's a group of genes called sex determining region Y. And there are two, kind of signaling molecules that are coded for here. One is testosterone and the other is anti-malarian hormone or AMH. I will say that all X chromosomes carry a lot of signaling molecule genes as well. <clears throat> so when we are starting at the beginning of this different, different phase, right? We've got two sets of tubes and they are mesonephric and paramesonephric. And in the presence of testosterone, we will see that mesonephric duct differentiation begins, and these structures will eventually become the adult structures of the epididymis and the ductus deferens. And in the presence of anti-malarian hormone, which is also from the SRY gene, or SRY region rather, um, that's going to give a stop signal to the development of the paramesonephric ducts. So it's gonna kind of push things in the direction of um, the anatomy that we see here, kind of biologically male. And when we don't have testosterone, the mesonephric ducts don't have that kind of go forward signal. So they'll begin to degrade. Meanwhile, the paramesonephric ducts are not receiving that stop signal from AMH. And so they'll go forward with their development and they become uterine tubes, uterus and other kind of biologically female structures. And again, this is a simplified view. There are a number of other signaling molecules present, uh, but this kind of gives us that, that homology. <clears throat> and the external genitalia as well develop from kind of this indifferent stage to a different stage based on the signaling molecules present. So when we're at the end of the indifferent stage, we have kind of a midline structure, the genital tubercle, and we have a pair of structures um, laterally from that structure that are um, folds and swellings. <clears throat> and so these genital folds and genital swellings may fuse together, as we can see in the top panel here to become a scrotum, or they may stay separate, in which case they'll become labia. And then that midline structure, the genital tubercle, will um, is actually composed of erectile tissue. And so all of that erectile tissue may develop in a kind of outward fashion, in which case it becomes a kind of outward erectile tissue structure called the penis or that same erectile tissue may develop more on an internal capacity, leaving only a small amount of the erectile tissue on the outside of the body and the majority of the erectile tissue inside, in which case we call it a clitoris. <clears throat> but again, it's kind of the same arrangement of erectile tissue, the same you know, genital swellings and genital folds. It's just going to develop in one way or another, kind of based on which signaling molecules are present. All right, so I will stop again at the end of my very simplified you know, um, setup of um, development to see if there are any kind of points for discussion or questions. I am not seeing um, any questions coming through. Uh, there was a few com uh, comments that uh, there are definitely folks learning how to teach development right now. So well, I, wonder, I wonder if they're taking the Mark Nielsen. I wanted to take that, of course. Um, Mark Nielsen is like, you know, the the top of our field in terms of how to make um, development interesting and relevant to our students. Um, yes, Wendy, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, this, this is not Mark Nielsen level. <laughs> this is a couple of slides that I use, but I do think uh, kind of inspired by the way that he teaches that it does help us to kind of understand the eventual anatomical um, arrangement of structures. And so this is a way that I use to kind of um, really increase that idea of homology we all have the same stuff, 
it's organized slightly different in all of us. And then getting back to that kind of idea of like disorders of sexual development, differences in sexual development. What if it's really that we're all different from each other, right? Like there's just a lot of diversity and you're going to feel maybe you fall more on this end. Maybe you feel fall more on this end, but there is kind of a lot of difference of us. It's kind of the perspective that I usually take when I get this. Okay, um, so then well, after we get through that, that little bit of development, we're able to get to puberty and adulthood. And so again, the like glasses that I have my students put on is about hormones, right? Endocrine first. And that allows us to kind of think about the effects of our hormones on our tissues, which leads us to understanding the kind of um, differences that, that we commonly teach. So don't worry, I'm gonna break up this slide a little bit, but this is the, the kind of first entry point to talking about puberty and sex, secondary sex characteristics that I use, which is kind of, again, if we're talking about hormones first, we're gonna start with GnRH, we'll get to LH, and LH is gonna have different effects and FSH are gonna have different effects depending on what structures we have in the body. So let's kind of um, zoom in on that fourth bullet point there where we're talking about estrogen and testosterone. And I won't kind of read through this because I know that you guys are all capable of reading too, but I kind of go through the impacts on all the tissues, right? The widespread uh, impacts on um, the tissues of these different hormones so that that kind of leads us to the understanding of what happens, right? So, um, you know, estrogen is pro-mitotic. It's promitotic in, in breast tissue. It's also promitotic in the endometrium, right? So I kind of put these, these ideas out there and then I pick them back up uh, as, we, as we go along. So that, that list is on the left of your screen. The right is two um, slides that I grabbed from a Google image search um, about secondary sex characteristics. And you can see that this pre common presentation is like, men have these, women have these. But instead, if we use this kind of estrogen impacts this, testosterone but does this, right? Then we don't have to assume that all of the people listening to our presentation fit into those categories. What we allow ourselves to do is say, if there's a high level of estrogen signaling, these are some of the things that might be happening. And that way, if you did have a student who maybe was born, you know, assigned male at birth that has been transitioning and using exogenous estrogen, we don't have to fit into them into any category because we're saying, if you have a lot of estrogen signaling, here's the impacts on the body and they can fit themselves. <clears throat> so then again, with kind of the structures, I do a homologous approach. I often will put up images of both side by side and I'll say, right, remember those genital swellings and genital folds, here they are fused, here they are separate. Um, and I, I do focus a little bit on, you know, the arrangement of erectile tissue, right? Everybody's got erectile tissue, internal in some individuals, it's more external in other individuals. Everyone has some internal, everyone has some external, but the proportion, that's going to be a result of the signaling molecules that were present during development. And then I do focus a little bit on that promitotic effect of estrogen because there's a lot of places we can go that are interesting from there, right? Not only do we then have development of breast tissue, it leads us towards being able to talk about the menstrual cycle, but it also leads us to things like talking about, you know, breast cancer um, or, you know, menopause, right? Other questions that might be um, things that we can tap into for high level blooms questions or that the students might be curious about. So I'm going to stop for a second and see what's going on with questions. Okay, so here is a question. Would you prefer to use development stages in every system in AIM? Mm. So I think that many of our instructors do that. Over time, I would say that I have increased the amount of um, development that I bring in. For example, I think it's kind of helpful with the heart to talk about how it, you know, it, we used to have the exits of the ventricles on the bottom and then it flips up and turns around and that helps us to understand the very kind of twisted, complicated anatomy of the heart. So I do bring in a little bit in some of the other um, systems, but I would say that's the growth area for me. That's something that I do a little bit more as I get kind of older or more experienced. Not Did you see a question came in through chat here? Do the male-female symbols use uh, automatically imply gender? 
my understanding of the use of those symbols. Again, it was just kind of like a reference for how other people um, can often see, you know, how we can often see these things represented. Um, but I think that that is what the um, person had put that slide together and intended. Thank you, Liz. Okay. All right, so then I thought that I would um, talk a little bit about like seeing this in action. So how I would present things that are not just structures, but the physiology. So by my estimate, I think this is the second most hated graph in anatomy and physiology. I think Wigger's diagram is the first most hated graph. And I think this is the second most hated graph. Um, and I think it's, it's complicated, it's multi-paneled, like there's a lot going on. And so I wanted to kind of lead us through it and again, kind of illustrate that hormone's first perspective. So I start with the anterior pituitary hormones. We kind of started with that and we talked a little bit about puberty. So up here at the top of my screen, we've got GnRH, LH and FSH, and that's the same in all individuals. And then LH and FSH are gonna have different effects on ovaries versus testes. So depending on, on what an individual has, we're gonna see some different effects of these hormones. So in ovaries, FSH drives follicular development. The LH surge triggers ovulation and lower levels of LH support and maintain the corpus luteum. In testes, FSH has kind of a parallel function, right? Drives follicular development in ovary, drives um, along with testosterone, drives spermatogenesis uh, in testes. And then LH uh, stimulates testosterone production by the interstitial cells. So if we go back to the graph and apply what we kind of just listed, Right. So FSH drives follicular development. So here is that high um, FSH level that we have uh, in the beginning of the um, menstrual cycle, or the ovarian cycle in this case. Uh, and we can see that that's increasing FSH levels is driving that follicular development. So that's why we call the first half the follicular phase, because we are driving follicular development through follicle stimulating hormone. <clears throat> And then we can see that um, LH, right? We talked about the surge of LH causing ovulation, the moment when the um, oocyte is released. So here we can see that in the middle of the panel. And then the follicle that is left behind in the ovary after ovulation is now the corpus luteum. And those lower levels of, of um, LH, of luteal uh, hormone is going to support and maintain that corpus luteum. So we call this luteal phase. <clears throat> So we have established that the anterior pituitary hormones, right, drive the development of the follicle and the maintenance of the corpus luteum. Turns out that these structures are endocrine glands. Uh, and so these structures produce estrogen and testosterone, which allows us to go back to our graph and add the third panel. So as we have the follicle developing, it is creating or secreting rather um, a lot of our estrogens. The follicles, while they have the oocyte in place, are not secreting any progesterone. Progesterone is only made by the corpus luteum, so we can see that it only comes online in the second half of the graph. All right, so estrogen and progesterone are two hormones. Let's talk about what they do. We've met estrogen before. Uh, so estrogen promotes muscle building. It increases the collagen content of the tissues, decreases ligament stiffness, promotes bone density, inhibits inflammation, drives up mitosis in both breast tissue and endometrial tissue, and in, um, drives sperm maturation in the testes. Progesterone increases sperm motility, decreases smooth muscle contractility. So in the presence of progesterone, we're gonna see the smooth muscle of the uterus not contracting as much. If progesterone levels fall, then we get more contraction. So when the smooth muscle of the uterus contracts, it has the capability of expelling the contents of the uterus. And so that's how, how menstruation works is we see the fall in progesterone lead to increases in contractility and we um, um, expel the endometrium. And that's also how birth works is those contractions to do um, a decrease in progesterone um, and other factors, which if we had time for talk about birth, we would talk about. Uh, progesterone also inhibits immune activity. <clears throat> so as we look at um, these hormones, right, we talked a little bit about progesterone uh, and its effects on the uterus. We also talked a little bit about estrogen being promitotic. So we can add our fourth panel of the diagram back in. So as estrogen concentrations increase, we drive mitosis in the endometrium, we build up the endometrial lining. Progesterone helps to make sure that endometrial lining stays in place. When progesterone levels are low, uterine contractility goes up. Uh, and we um, 
have the menstruation part of the menstrual cycle. <clears throat> so we've put all of our four panels back together uh, and kind of used that hormones to talk about each component of it. These I will just drop in there and let you read them. I came up with three kind of higher level blooms questions that, you, that I would use in class in order to have the students work through their understanding of these complex graphs. I feel like in my classroom, when my students are presented with a complicated graph, they kind of stare at it as if that will burn it into their retinas and then it will be a part of their brain, but they don't really work on understanding them. So I actually have my students redraw this through the through questions. So questions lead them to the redrawing of each component of the graph. Um, but these are some of the questions that I tend to ask them uh, in class uh, about these phases to kind of help them work on their understanding. And so I have a couple more things to talk about. One is that I've been thinking so much lately about language, and that's kind of the idea behind this, right? going back to Patrick's question of disorders versus differences, right? When we just use certain phrases or swap out some of the things that we say, it can really impact our students. So things like biological male, biological female, instead of male or female is like kind of step one. But if you can even go further to talk about like a person with testes or, or testes respond to LH and FSH this way, ovaries will have this response to those hormones. Uh, that kind of thing, then that even kind of uh, further eliminates those uh, male and female words whenever possible. I was in prep for this, I was kind of looking through um, some other, some textbooks um, to think about how these concepts are presented um, in our field. And one of the things that I saw was in the discussions of pregnancy, um, the authors were sometimes referring to the pregnant person as a mother. I thought about this hard um, and, and decided to, to bring it up within the context of this webinar, because I think that mothering is, is a, a kind of gendered word for parenting, but that's different from the physiological thing of pregnancy, right? So lots of people um, go through pregnancy and then, and then their, their offspring then leave for, to be parented by other people, right? Um, maybe they're adopted away, for example. Um, and that pregnant person, might not identify as a mother. And then I also think of all the mothers out there who didn't have their children through pregnancy, right? You know, fostered or adopted or surrogacy. Um, so I, I think actually we should probably work really hard on eliminating that idea of mother um, from the physiological um, set of things that happen during pregnancy and birth. I thought about that and then I'm triggering for some of our students. Uh, and then I usually say things like structures that developed under the influence of estrogen. Like instead of the female pelvis, I'll say a pelvis that's developed under the influence of estrogen, things like that. So going back to this slide that I um, presented during our discussion of the ovarian and menstrual cycles, just to, to show a couple of ways you can tie this into other content areas. So the decrease in ligament stiffness that happens in response to estrogen uh, is actually um, has effects all over the body. And I think the, the kind of hallmark of this is the female pelvis, right? So we often illustrate um, the female pelvis has, you know, a wider subcubic angle, it has a greater distance between the ischials of two varieties, blah, 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 right? This like couple of bullet points about the female pelvis. So a, a paper came out a couple of years ago that actually illustrated that once estrogen levels fall during menopause, that the pelvis returns back to what we have been teaching as a male pelvis, right? It becomes more narrow and all of those differences kind of disappear. So not only is it more inclusive to say a pelvis that has um, developed under the influence of estrogen, but it's actually more correct, right? Because we're including postmenopausal pelvises and, and prepubescent pelvises, well, but, you know, as the bones are fusing. Um, so that's kind of like a, a great way that we can tie this content into other places in the body, like the musculoskeletal system. It also helps us to be able to, to hit onto like a hot topic or something that might be interesting to our students. For example, that knee injuries are much more common in female athletes than male athletes, it's actually tied to the decrease in ligament stiffness. And so that helps us um, to be able to kind of hit on some of those more kind of interesting um, places where we might pique student interest. Um, the, both of our um, hormones here, estrogen and progesterone, have impacts on the immune system. Uh, their fluctuations through the menstrual cycle can impact 
uh, the um, uh, immune system. So particularly fluctuations in progesterone are tied to changes in autoimmune disease symptoms. So if we were teaching the immune system, we'd be able to kind of bring these ideas in instead of just a kind of rote list of what happens in an autoimmune disease, we can, we can kind of tie it back to these influences. And then the last one is, you'll notice that, you know, I was going through the, um, the ovarian and menstrual cycles, but I did bring in these kind of uh, impacts on, on sperm, um, sperm development. And so I think it's just a nice place to be able to point out to the students. It's not like women are from estrogen and men are from testosterone, right? It is these are signaling molecules that are present in all of our bodies. And testosterone is actually converted to estrogen in many of our tissues. And so when we say a process is driven by testosterone, we often mean a process is directly driven by estrogen that was con produced from conversion from uh, testosterone. So for example, even in the, skeleton, in the skeleton of all of our bodies, right, bones only express estrogen receptors. And so testosterone does not have a direct impact on these bones, but it can have an impact there if aromatase is around, which it is. <clears throat> okay, so that was um, kind of the, um, the culmination of how I think that, you know, you can, um, use some different language uh, that might allow our students to feel more comfortable, decrease their anxiety and develop that sense of kind of community and belonging, as well as provide some opportunities to enhance the medical accuracy of the information that we're presenting uh, and then tie it to other content areas. So I will um, ask if there are any more questions or points for discussion at this point. Thank you, Liz. Uh, right now, I do not see any other questions. There are some good comments coming through in chat here. I'm not sure if you've uh, been looking at them every so often, but um, yeah, nothing, nothing else here right now. So I think we can uh, continue to move forward. Okay. So the next slide is you, Adam. Thank you very much, Liz. So just wanted to. Uh, let you all know that this page right here is going to contain the recording to this session as well as um, the other sessions that we will be having in the next couple weeks here. So I'm going to go ahead and drop this link into the Zoom chat um, should you all want to bookmark just in case. But um, yeah, thank you, Liz, for um, a great session here. And we just want to see if there are any questions that uh, come up before we have uh, have you all go for the day. Getting some kind words in here. Um, I don't know if we're going to have any more questions that uh, come through, but thank you everyone for